I'm very excited to give this presentation. I've talked about cactus uh, many times before. You can catch a lot of uh, cacti horticulture education and information for free all the time on uh, my personal social media, max.montrose. I had my dad take a picture of me cutting San Pedro and starting this journey because 10 years ago, this cactus informed me that we have a lot of work to do together in this world and on this journey. And that education that the cactus told me, sat me down and gave me a lesson the way that grandpa is good at doing, was really serious. It was loud and it was clear, clear as day, that this cactus and I, we have a relationship with each other and we have a, a responsibility. And it's to teach people about these plants. And so far, I've been honored with that opportunity. Uh, the universe brings it my way. And so thank you, Double Blind. Uh, for being a part of that uh, universal opportunity. So what kinds of cacti are active and where do they come from? Well, most people know about the peyote types or most people just know that there's a type called peyote. Let's just say that, right? Um, and uh, the type of peyote that you're looking at right there is uh, Lephophora, uh, Williamsi, uh, variety Texana, or actually that's just a, uh, that's not a Texana, that's just a, Love of Aurora Williamsi, and we'll get into this. Something really interesting that I want you to pay attention to, though, about this plant is look at grandpa's hair. You see that old, that fuzz. A lot of people don't know that those are actually trichomes. Um, they're non-glandular trichomes. Typically, non-glandular trichomes are referred to as cystolithic or unicellular, but I'm not sure if these are those specific types of trichomes. I can just tell you that for a fact, they are trichomes. So the cactus and cannabis both produce trichomes. Many plants do, but the trichomes on cactus are not special. <laughs> They're just fuzzy hair. And the word trichome actually um, comes from the ancient Greek word trichoma means hairs. And so these are the hairs of plants, right? You can see your tomato plants are covered in uh, both glandular and non-glandular plant hairs. So the hairs that cactus grows um, don't really do much, but I just, you know, find it super cool that, I mean, I started the Trichome Institute, so this is pretty interesting. I asked this cactus, I said, cactus, when you spend so much of your time trying to hide, why is your fruit neon pink, like hot pink? Uh, and the cacti told me, he's like, men just to trick the birds uh, so that they eat the fruit thinking that it's a worm, which makes perfect sense, right? And so these plants are really difficult to grow themselves in nature. So if you can imagine this peyote plant having birds see these bright pink fruits come up kind of near the shrubbery, um, if a bird were to digest this, the seeds uh, would most likely survive the stomach, would be encapsulated in a nitrogen package that would become uh, moist when it rains, and, and there you go. And then we have columnar types, right? And so what types? Columnar. And that stands for column. And these, these are cacti that just grow in columns. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of columnar types that are psychoactive. And some of them are also psychedelic. And psychoactive and psychedelic are not the same thing. For example, the little cactus over here that says non-mescaline type, that is an Aztecium retiri, which is not psychedelic, but is psychoactive. Or this can get confusing, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this. It's a cacti type that is used in ceremony and ritual, but it has no mescaline in it. And so we'll talk about that too. And then something that I want you to notice on this columnar type is a lot of people might think like, hey, you know, that's San Pedro. And if you notice, it's more blue than it is green. And its needle structure is about twice as long as what you would commonly find on San Pedro. So that is not a San Pedro. That is a Trichocereus pachinoi var peruvianus, which is a hybrid between the Peruvian torch and San Pedro. Um, which is uh, a cross that I did myself. So that is a plant that you're looking at that I crossbred two different psychoactive cacti types together, produced seed, germinated them, and then have grown mature plants out of them, uh, which is pretty fantastic. And then uh, when it comes to the color blue, if you don't know, blue is the color of magic. And so 
uh, like psilocybin mushrooms, when they uh, become bruised or exposed to oxygen, they turn blue. Opiate poppies, right? Um, Papavia somniferum. How do you know when they're ready to bleed opiate rubber? Uh, when their pods turn blue. And blue is an indication for a lot of San Pedro types that mescaline is present. In fact, the more blue your cacti is, it seems to be the more mescaline it has. Very interesting. Um, and if you notice, the peyote plant itself is a cactus that is blue. Um, they are, they can be green, especially when they're younger. So in the wild, this is what peyote looks like. And generally, it only has three types of habitat. One is the desert floor. And so if you look at the first uh, photo on the top left and in the middle, what you'll notice is when the plant is on the desert floor, it is so hot where these plants come from, uh, and they are so unprotected because this is a cactus that has no needles that they try to hide as much as possible. And in, in fact, sometimes they're really hard to find because they are literally just growing underneath the, the sand and the dirt. And sometimes you only notice when they're there because they'll only throw out a flower that will just almost come out of the ground. So these plants like to hide from a very harsh environment. Um, and then if you can also see this awesome photo, uh, you can see the root mass of this peyote, which is important to pay attention to. It's tubular, and these tubular root masses have a ton of strength in them. And so if you actually cut the plant the right way, uh, the way that a lot of native peoples know how to do, like uh, the Huicho people um, and other people who are just very respectful of the plant, these plants can actually regrow themselves much faster than you think. And that comes from that tubular root mass that has all of that uh, genetic power and, and energy and strength in it. So these plants are unbelievably strong. They can go through an immense amount of freezing temperatures and brutal temperatures as well. When they're not out on the desert floor, they're generally tucked right at the base of plants that are bushes that grow uh, in the wild where these plants come from. Uh, and we'll get into their geography here in a second. But it's very, very common for you to see them hiding in the shade underneath uh, these plants. And that's typically when it's not the desert floor, it's a little bit more forested, if you will. And then last but not least, uh, if, if you don't see them growing in those places, you'll see them growing out of the crevices of rocks, almost with no dirt. Um, these plants are incredible. It is not easy for their seed mass to replicate, uh, which is one of the reasons why they're not um, commonly found in the wild. Something that I did want to show you, though, is natural morphology. And so um, if you look at the middle photo, the peyotes on the left of that photo were are cut off a little bit, but what you can tell is it's the same variety of the peyote um, right above it, which is the the most common type, which is genus Luffophora and species Williamsi. And in the cactus community, some people pronounce it Williams I. Uh, in fact, people will yell at me for saying Williamsi. <laughs> um, and so is it Frick I or is it Frick E? Tomato, tomato. But uh, what's really interesting is look at the variety of this Luffophora williamsi. Um, when it's not a singular button, it bubbles up. And that's creating uh, a, a variety type, which is known as caspatosa, okay? Which is what this peyote is here. This is a Luffophora williamsi var caspatosa, which is a type of peyote that grows many, 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 many heads. So this is this peyote that grows a bush of peyote instead of individual buttons. Keep that in mind <laughs> when we talk about peyote conservation here in a little bit. Um, and then another really interesting morphological type is on the uh, bottom left, uh, Luffophora williamsi var cristata, which is from fasciation. Uh, which is fascinating. <laughs> uh, and fasciation is a morphological growth trait of growing horizontally, which is different from a morphology of growing vertically, which I will show you. Uh, but this is a wild crested peyote. Um, and crested peyote is pretty damn cool just because it's even rarer than typical peyote. So if you're a 
cactus collector, these are the really interesting things that you might want to show off to your friends in your collection because they're really cool to talk about um, and to share with your friends, right? Okay, so getting into varieties. So on the far left, top left, is your classic Lophophora williamsi or Williams eye. And that's what most people know as peyote. So when people know peyote, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about peyote, peyote, that's peyote, right? Um, and of course, look at that photo, right? Um, you can tell it's in a more forested area. So where do you find the plant? Uh, tucked up uh, near another plant hiding right at the base. Very typical uh, of, of peyote. Um, so left before Williams. Now look at this little globular monster just to the right of it. That is uh, the genus Lophophora, but that is not a Williams eye. That is a Lophophora diffusia or diffusia. Uh, and then next to that one on the right is Lophophora Williamsi variety Texana. Uh, so more of your Texas variety of Lophophora. That's what you would find in North America. Um, and I really like that star shape or pattern. And what you what you need to do is pay attention to the most minuscule uh, things here. So the diffusia, how do you know that that's diffusia? Look at that rib structure. It's the same pattern as the underside of quilting. And instead of growing almost up and out, it almost has like an indentation, like a belly button that never uh, becomes an Audi. It's like a forever any <laughs> belly button type of peyote button, right? Very cute. But that's how you know it's a fuchsia. And you're, you're paying attention to these rib structures, which also can change a little bit depending on geography, environment, all these other things. Uh, the one to the right is Lophophora fricky or fricki. How do you know? Look at that rib structure. Isn't it gorgeous? That's Frick Guy, okay? And then just below the Lophophora williamsi, what is that? Lophophora williamsi. What variety? Var caspitosa. What does caspitosa mean? Multiple headed. But that is not a plant in the wild. And when they're not growing in the really, really harsh environment where you know, water is scarce, they become easily sunburned, eaten by uh, many animals, poached by human beings. It's not easy uh, to grow this beautifully. Uh, but when you do grow them in greenhouses and, and give them all of their proper nutrients and water, it's pretty incredible how fast you can grow these very slow growing plants. Uh, next to that, Lophophora williamsi var cristata. And remember, I showed you both of those varieties of Lophophora williamsi, same genus, same species, but these are varieties of morphology, not genealogy. These are the same genetics, they just have morphological traits within their genome, which are causing them to grow in slightly different ways. And so again, this is fasciation, but this is not wild fasciation, this is fasciation in a greenhouse. So what you're looking at is a, a, a type of peyote that is worth showing off to your buddies who care about this kind of stuff because that is just spectacular. Look at that presentation. <laughs> I mean, that is good. That is really good. All right. Now, to the right of that, I'm just going to call that Cousin It. And the reason why I'm going to call it Cousin It is because it's a little hairball. Uh, remember, those hairs are trichomes. And I don't have a clue what that is. This is a unbelievable hybrid of probably five or six different peyote types that is grown in Asia. Now, if you don't know this, outside of North America and Native American culture and psychedelic culture, the people who grow and know peyote, the best or the most, believe it or not, are people like Filipinos. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if you don't know the Philippines and Thailand, and how they grow peyote, what you have to understand is in Asian culture, for whatever reason, they just love slow growing plants that are also very rare. And so peyote fits the bill really perfectly. And so they do these wild hybridizations of peyote types. Um, and then so next to that is Lophophora williamsi, 
all the same genus, right? Um, same species, uh, but this is var variegation, excuse me. So that's variegated. And uh, that's just a um, variegation means a pigmentation change. So what you're looking at is a peyote plant that is uh, bicolored. And if you're a collector, that's pretty cool.